Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlis, and I am your host. The focus of this series is to show the amazing lives people live and are living. The key word here is live. Everyone has a story to tell, and all stories are worth celebrating. Over the years, I've heard too many obituaries that left me pondering, why did I not have a chance to meet this person while they were alive? The goal of this program is to celebrate the lives of everyday Vermonters who are all very much alive. If you would like to be interviewed or know someone who you think would like to be interviewed for this show, please contact me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. Now, I would like to introduce you to Sue Gay. Welcome, Sue. Thank you. Nice to be here. Glad to have you on the show. Pleased to be here. We are here today to celebrate your life. Where would you like to start? I uh, guess I'll start at the beginning. Okay. Sounds good. I, I, um, I'm 80 years old. I grew up in the 50s and 60s mostly in a small town in northern New Jersey, Madison, New Jersey, and I had a very cocoon-like life. It was a very overprotective parents and very well ca taken care of. And um, we moved for two years to Minneapolis, Minnesota, and then we came back to New Jersey. And um, I graduated from high school, Madison High School, 1962. And then I went off to college, Wilson College in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, which is a small girls, at the time was a small girls school, mm -hmm. Presbyterian, liberal arts, private. And um, I was spent most of my life there in the library. I was kind of introverted and um, I was a French major and an art history minor and I had loved my French language so very much. Where did you get that? Where did that come from? I think it came from, um, in high school I had took three years of French and I think it came, in the back of my mind I felt I needed a skill. Hmm. In, in addition to this liberal arts education opened me up to just a wonderful world mm. that I had never known, but I felt like I needed a skill. Mm. And I also, it was a little bit of an ego thing too. He said, do you speak French? Yes, I speak French. <laughs> and I was, I lived in the, there was a French dorm there. I lived for three years in that dorm where we only spoke, spoke French and we were wow. pretty rigid about it. Wow. And in my senior year, I was president of the dorm and um, I enjoyed it. Wow. Very much, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you ever gone to France? Um, we have traveled quite a bit, and um, I think I've been to France four times. Oh. I love it. I would Wonderful. love to go there and live for six months. Mm -hmm. I've seen uh, Paris, Alsace, Provence, Dordogne, and I'm hoping sometime to go to Brittany or Normandy. Those are two mm. areas. That I'm, but I'm, my daughter was a, an exchange student in France back in the 80s, and we've stayed in touch with her French sister, who's now a grown woman with a family of her own. And so we often see them when we go, which nice. is really, really That's fun. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, you skipped through that childhood of yours. Mm -hmm. um, do you mind if we go back and talk about it a little bit? Sure. Um, so you grew up in New Jersey, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. um, what did you have uh, as a child did you think of things you wanted to do when you grew up or did you have special people in your life that you really well I think I'll talk about my birth actually I, I forgot you remember about. that huh <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <yes. laughs> <We're> easy peasy <laughs> I was born during World War II mm. in a military hospital Naval Hospital in Newport Rhode Island my dad was a very patriotic marine and he was home briefly for my wow. birth Wow. During which my mother, um, I'm assuming the medical care maybe wasn't as good back then in a naval hospital for a woman, but right. uh, she got eclampsia and oh. she had me and her organs started shutting down. Mm. And my father said to me much later, how do you think I felt, Sue, when the woman I loved was near death and there was the baby that nearly killed her? Oh my and it just stuck with me. Mm. So then we went to live, my father went back to the South Pacific and mm. he was in that brutal war in Guadalcanal. Wow. I know he got malaria and was in a hospital in Australia. 
I think he might have been in um, the Philippines, but I'm not sure. Mm. So I lived with my grandmother, my mother, for two years. And my theory, as I l reflect back on my life, is he, we didn't bond, he and I. Mm. He did not bond. Mm. I, I never felt connected to him mm -hmm. at all. And he would, he, I know he was suffering. And, and I right. think it was PTSD. Right. With, and, and yet at the same time as a man in the 50s, you know, the head right. of the household. You plug along. You're, yes, and yeah. he worked hard, and, and he was basically an overachiever. Mm -hmm. He was going beyond what he could mm. cope with. Mm. And um, as, a, as a child, and even as an adult, like a lot of people, I was very wired to what was going on with him. I didn't think it was my fault, but I thought I needed, it was my responsibility to fix him, mm. to make him happy. Mm. Were you the only child? No, I was the oldest of three. Oldest of three. Three daughters, yeah. Three daughters, okay. So um, that was that was the, that my focus. The, stuck with you, yeah. Um, yeah. Forever, and anyway, he, because I guess of his over, he rose to be vice president of the Prudential Insurance Company, ironically, in the area of public relations and advertising, and he was not, he was an introvert. He was a shy introvert. And yet, I guess, he w I've seen this before. You go into a career that you think mm -hmm. is important. Anyway, um, and he had his first heart attack at 48. Wow. And he suffered for 20 years wow. with heart issues. And I, he was kept alive longer, I'm sure, because of the progress that's been made in cardiac care because his father died right around the age of 20. Oh. I mean 50. 50. Nice. So, you wow. know. Wow. So he w he always was front and center a fixture in my life. Yep. How can I help this man? Right. Yeah, your uh, your antenna were up and you're saying he needs help. Mm -hmm. And you took it on yourself to I did. provide that. And then when I was at my senior year, I got elected to Phi Beta Kappa. I heard that my father cried. I had just met Dave, who I was going to marry, who I loved dearly. My father hated Dave hmm. because Dave was not didn't have a military background and wasn't going to Vietnam because he he failed the eye eye test. Of course, yeah. his mother was ecstatic, and right. my father said he's a wimp. Right. But I was in love with him, wow. and one of the reasons I was in love with him is he was nothing like my father, mm. antithesis. Mm. And I would say, my, my children, whoever I have, I didn't know back then I had, would have two daughters, would have a great father, and they have. Right. And so, um, but at that time, it was a really bad crossroads. I fell into a deep depression, and um, I had to be hospitalized about it, and it really had to do with the dilemma for the first time in my life, I was going to shift your attention from, to, to, from, uh, from your father. Yeah, and I had this overwhelming idea that my parents were, in spite of everything I've said, were perfect, and I wanted to follow in their footsteps and live a life like theirs for some mm -hmm. reason. Here I meet Dave, mm -hmm. and it was just, it was just a big crossroads. Yeah, you were, it sounds like you were torn I between. Was, Th mm -hmm. The life you had, mm -hmm. this man you loved, mm -hmm. he was different, mm -hmm. and your life would be different in the future. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, we got married while I was still in college, and um, the funny thing was, I admired my mother, but I was so focused on him, mm -hmm. I didn't really appreciate how much I, in admiration I was of her. And one of the things was, um, stay at home, mom. The 70s were happening. I was looking over my shoulder at yep. um, Betty for Dan, and yep. I can't think of what the other gal's name was, and, and seeing my friends changing their paths. And I just wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. Yep. 
and one of the reasons was Dave was in the apparel business on the manufacturing side, and so he traveled. So I was I was a single mom. He was gone yep. all week, every week, mm. and we also moved nine times because, as you recall, um, the apparel industry was going offshore. Right. So he trying to stay ahead of the companies. So we moved up and down the East Coast from Maine to Tennessee. Wow. And every few years, we'd have to buy a house, usually a fixer-upper, take the kids, put, get them in school, get familiar with the... I just did not have the emotional wow. uh, stamina to also have a career at the same time. That's a, a household that's very much like uh, what they the army brats, you know, that they're moving oh, all over mm -hmm. from base to base, mm -hmm. never feel like they have a... A, yeah, a, and, um, an anchor there. Yeah, we never had a home, and um, so I did um, some volunteering. When we ended up in Maine, I went to volunteer for the public television station there, and I stayed there ten years because I had a charismatic boss, a woman who worked for the. She was so wonderful, so funny, so creative, and she just she saw the best in me and encouraged. Hmm. It to come out, so hmm. I w and we were in fundraising, and she sent me all over the state, and I just met some wonderful people, hmm. and then we had to move, so that was the <laughs> that was the end of that. But um, so when Aaron, my youngest Aaron was in third grade, uh, we lived down the street from Colby College in M Waterville, Maine, and a friend who worked there said there's an opening in admissions, and I jumped at the chance. So I worked in admissions at Colby College and um, just mm. loved it. I loved being on the campus, loved mm. the academic environment. Mm. It was a very happy job, you know, talking to um, prospective students and evaluating their credentials. This was right before the computer age, mm. so a very much hands-on paper folders <laughs> and all that. Yep, yep. And I traveled around to uh, high schools and hmm. um, talked to students about Colby. They sent me, because the new director of admissions wife was from North Carolina, they sent me down to North Carolina. It was very hard to tell these southern kids to come to Maine, college in Maine, <laughs> which was snowy right. most of the year. Right, right. But it, it was, it was I, I enjoyed the travel. So. Um, Sounds like another job, though, even though the first job was volunteer, but mm -hmm. they saw something in you that they really wanted you to stay. And this Colby, it sounds like they also were attracted to what you offered to get you out across the state yeah, and even thank you. North Carolina. Yeah. yeah. yeah I'm what What did they see? Well. Don't be modest. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, I mimicked my mother. <laughs> my mother was very outgoing. When you talked to her, you were the only person in her universe, wow. is the way you felt. Wow. She was just, she was lovely. Mm. And, and um, I was an introvert, but I saw how effective, and I felt like in our society, successful people are extroverts and outgoing, and I had an innate love of people. Mm. I will want to hear your story. Mm. I've always do. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I mimicked that. The problem was, my mother used alcohol okay. because her marriage to my father was difficult. Yeah. And so um, when she died, I turned to alcohol by choice. I said, well, it worked for her. It made her loving. It made her funny. It made her affectionate. It made her just happy. Mm -hmm. And so when she died, I got and but I got in trouble. Yep. So. I went, I went to, um, it was just a program in the evenings, I th and um, went there for, I guess it was a month program, and then I did not join AA because I just thought, these people are not my people. Mm. And so I was sober for two years. and. I was told you're a dry drunk. I hated that word. Yeah. I hated dry drunk. Yeah. 
So I got into AA and it was just life changing. It was, it was, exactly. it was, I was in Louisville, Kentucky. We were living there at the time and I made wonderful friends and they had programs around the clock and study groups and it, it was the hardest thing I've ever done, mm. but it was the, the greatest gift I ever got. Mm. Just absolutely loved it. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you, yeah, you faced a difficult problem and then you did something about it. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm not, I'm not embarrassed, you know, it's anonymity is a foundation, but I've been sober for 24 years and wow. I'm happy to share my experience. Bravo to you. If it, if it would help someone but I'm not out there waving the flag. Right, right. Bravo and so, you. yeah, so it, um, I still keep in touch with my sponsor. She lives in Idaho now. Your original sponsor? Mm hmm Oh my goodness. Yep, Good and um, we don't communicate as often, but um, we're, she was just a, quite a unique woman and how she turned her life around is still just dazzles me. Mm. So, and she was, um, a fundamental Christian, mm -hmm. and I'm not, and um, it did not impact in any negative way. Right. Yeah, so she was. Right. Now, you said it dazzled you, what she did with turning around her life. Mm -hmm. How about moi? <laughs> oh, moi. <laughs> um, I mean. Yes, my daughters have never acknowledged that I was an alcoholic. Which, okay, I'll have let that go. Um, and Dave was an enabler. Mm. It was kind of like, you've heard the expression, the devil you know. Yep. And yep. so he was very much an enabler mm -hmm. for a long time. I got sober, and about six months after I got sober, I came home, he's in bed in a fetal position. And I said, Dave, what's the matter? He says, I don't know who you are. Mm. And luckily I had some background by then and I said maybe Al-Anon would help you. Mm. So he came into Al-Anon almost simultaneous with me and we were in it, we walked it together. Wow. And I feel very appreciative because a lot of spouses yes. don't do that. Wow. And he got very, and um, it opened up a lot of issues for him and um, he got involved in al mm -hmm. with a friend and the, the kids loved him. It was like the grandfather they didn't have. Hmm. And of course he got a lot back. He too. got a lot back from that too. So Absolutely. that was good. And then um, we can't, we, um, I had a lot, I, I did a lot of part-time work because after my, both my parents dropped dead and everybody said, oh, you're so lucky. And I said, mm, mm. I don't feel lucky. Mm. And yeah. so I went and volunteered for, I worked, actually worked for, it was a new elder care program. There are lots of them now where you go in, you don't have to be a nurse. You can go in and it's about companionship and maybe a, a little housekeeping, whatever. Yep. And I was assigned a couple. She had um, Alzheimer's and he had a dementia caused by strokes. Mm. And I went in and I worked worked with them for about a year and a half before we moved again. And I learned so much, you know, so much about their suffering mm. and how my parents were spared. Mm. All of wow. that, that yes. decline, that yes. long, slow decline. Yes. So I, 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 really it was, it looks on the outside like they were helping, I was helping them, but they were helping me yeah. so much. It allowed you to come to grips with the sudden death of both parents. Exactly. And appreciate that, where at the time it was hard to. No, it was very upset. Yeah, it was very upsetting. So, um, so that was good. And then um, when we lived in Tennessee, one of my favorite jobs I worked in an independent bookstore, hmm. in s book selling. I just loved. And, um, but like, it's true in a lot of places in America, the big chain came moved in and. Uh, our little store went under, oh. but I, I had a, a few years there, um, really, really enjoyment. And uh, we had a lot of people come in. I, this is a sort of a joke, tongue in cheek, but a lot of people come in for certain books 
and what I learned was you cannot find a man or lose weight from a book. But we sold a ton of those. We bought a ton of those books. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. You can't find a man or, or lose, lose weight, weight from, from a book. A book. <laughs> but you sold a ton of them. <laughs> I sold a ton of both. <laughs> That's and, great. Yeah. So, um, so that was really a fun time. Most of my paycheck went for books. <laughs> right. But, um, but I, I had a wonderful time there. You love to read. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any any particular kind of books that you like? No, I think I like a wide variety of books, fiction, mm -hmm. nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a big mystery fan, mm -hmm. like a lot of people are. Um, but I just read a, read a wide range of of books. Um, I had let's see, four years ago, I had I took a very bad fall, mm. and I I got a I went to the hospital for four days and I had a concussion and bleeding on the brain. Mm -hmm. Two years later, I had, all, I had these weird symptoms and my doctor didn't identify them. And um, she was out of town and I went to her, the doctor was covering and with a bad headache that was moving around my head and she s sent me for a CAT scan and she called me up and she said, get to the emergency room right away. You have um, fluid on the brain, mm. which is called when I was growing up, it was called um, hydrocephalus, and mostly it was right. little babies with big heads and tubes. Yep. But now there's a form called NPH, which is um, normal pressure hydrocephalus that happens in people 55 and up. Hmm. And it was triggered by the fall. And do many doctors can't ident don't identify mm -hmm. it, and they get it mixed up with other things because we're aging people, so they, they right. diagnose it as Parkinson's, or a stroke, or dementia, or whatever. I mean, there are three, this is sort of a public service announcement. There are three symptoms that don't match. Um, one of them is wa wobbling walking. You shuffle like a penguin. You can't pick your feet up. Right. And if you get going real fast, you can't stop. Mm. The other one is um, incontinence, and that, that's self-explanatory. Yep. And then the other one is, is mental. Mm -hmm. short-term memory and stuff mm. but they seem like my doctor treated them as separate issues didn't see them as the right but you don't see it in Vermont's population is so so I discovered the Hy um, hydrocephalus association in Bethesda Maryland and they're doing all sorts of things like a lot of these disease they're doing research and fundraising and programs and conferences and I, they put me in touch with a private email group. I learned a lot through those people. And mm. then I got, a, I got a peer, this woman, this lovely woman about my age in Birmingham, Alabama, mm. who suffers from hydrocephalus mm. much longer than me. She, and um, I can ask her anything. And she's so wonderful. And so wow. we, what you get, you get, a shunt in your brain that goes from your brain down to to uh, your abdomen, and um, there's a little valve on it that they they have to figure out how much drainage right. is right for you, and they can literally just put this thing here, wow, and it changes the opening, and you, it's no feeling, no nothing. Wow, it's just it's just a blessing. This is not a cure, so I have to be very vigilant. Yeah. Yeah. And what I started to say was that um, it affect, uh, affected my f focus, so it was hard for me to read, but I was not going to give up. I said, you know, I'll read 10 pages if that's all I can do. Mm -hmm. And I seem to have... Been able to... Comp you got that. Uh, I got that. And uh, so, th so that's been good. And there's another quality. It's called apathy. And it's not depression. Mm -hmm. It's just... I just don't care. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to do anything. And I'm not sad. And so I have to, you know. Fight that too. I have to fight that, yeah. Wow. But, um, wow. so it's, um, I live, with, it, it's a concern. I live with some, some worry. And my reality, I try to explain to people, and it's not the same as it was. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I can't tell exactly tell you why. I'm very fortunate that I don't have anything else. 
because a lot of people who have it, because we're aging, we have other right other things going on. Other that, things, and yeah, I'm very yeah. very fortunate. Boy, you're a tough cookie, <laughs> uh, and you've come through some significant challenges in your life. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I the other one I had, which I forgot to mention, in 2007. I had I acquired sepsis and was in the hospital for a month, and I wasn't supposed to survive. My goodness! And um, it was it was a, a quite a journey, but wow. it's behind me. Wow! <laughs> I mean, most people don't make it, but anyway, wow. yeah. So, if we could talk for a second about um, some of the people in your lives. That, and you've mentioned a few already mm -hmm. that have helped you through some of these situations mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. have been like guiding lights for you as you've gone through your life. Mm -hmm. And the, the woman in Alabama, your sponsor, mm -hmm. uh, your husband, it oh, sounds mm -hmm. like for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Any other those special? Well, growing up, it was my Aunt Mary, my mother's sister. She, she, um, she didn't have, she could, didn't think she could have children for so for a long time. Me and my sisters were her, mm. and she doted on us. And she was—that's the first place and place I ever learned unconditional love. Mm. She was just so amazing. Wow. Yeah, you know, so she's very special to me. My nana, my mother's mother, mm. uh, and she—I just—I loved her. She was just wonderful. She was Pennsylvania Dutch, and um, my grandfather was kind of a difficult man but she made a beautiful home and um, I remember her home so well when I went back for my 50th high school reunion I wrote to the people that lived in her home and said could I come by and oh. I showed some pictures of me as a baby in the front <laughs> yard and all that and they said no what they said no <laughs> what <laughs> well it's scary these days oh my goodness yeah so let me see um mm. I had a I had a uh, the head of the French department at, in college was a very difficult woman, and she was kind of in the, I put her in the category with my dad, authoritarian, and I, I needed to figure out how to get her to like me and mm -hmm. do what she says, and like he did, and so she was a negative. And then when I was, um, when I went to college, I got a job at a swim and tennis club teaching swimming to little kids and working in the office and the guy who owned it was the same profile and I was just drawn to this mm. negative authority I don't know I don't know why and then when I met the woman of course at the public television station was totally just yeah free form yeah. creativity laughing do silly yeah. things isn't it amazing how people can create an environment, good and not so good? Yes, know? really. Uh, and I think we learn over time to mm -hmm. avoid those that are not so good and move, move really? to the ones that are more supportive. Mm -hmm. and That's the whole journey. And, and yeah. um, for me now is um, we moved to Wake Robin mm, last November, and the time was right because of illnesses that I, I had and stuff and it's a time for me to clear the slate and mm. peel away it, I, my life has always been about what do you want from me mm -hmm. what do you want from me what do you expect from me what should I do right and it's sort of uncovering me at long last wow this is that's beautiful yeah I don't want to be the Indian the the chief I want to just be a little Indian yeah um yeah I, I don't want to share a committee. Yeah. I want to work in my garden. <laughs> yeah, and it's okay to do that. I know, it's so okay. <laughs> so it's like the real me is. Oh, that's beautiful. Un unfolding, wow. and I, I just I'm, I just love it. Wow. And that, it, I never thought that I would find um, acceptance and tranquility at the end of life. I didn't, I really didn't want to look there. Mm. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm inching toward it. I'm very happy. It sounds like it, mm -hmm. yeah. And you've cleared the way 
you know, I mean, the fact that you're 24 years into recovery now mm -hmm. gave you 24 years to start to explore yourself in a way that when you weren't in recovery, mm -hmm. you couldn't do that. No. Um, and I found out, like, the end, the end is not doom and gloom, the end. The right. end is the, the, is the portal to a new beginning. Mm. And so um, that's how I got to All Souls. Mm. I got to the point where AA was a rich and enduring experience for me, but I wanted more. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go deeper. Mm. And I just, by a fluke, discovered All Souls. Now that's All Souls for the audience is a interfaith community in Shelburne. Yes, right. That you're a part of. Yes. yes, and we were living in Colchester at the time, and there was no advertising. I don't remember how I discovered it, but I went in there and I just, I looked, I sat in the sanctuary and I looked out the window and I said, "I'm home. Mm. I'm home." And it's wow. just opened up a whole world of ideas and thoughts and. To, to just delight in and and find my soul, and I'm really really happy That's there. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, any special times in your life, trips, uh, experiences, events that you want to talk about? Mm -hmm. Well, one, one was. When we lived in Pennsylvania, a tiny town called Woolrich, 600 people, one institution, the Methodist Church. So the Methodist minister, I jokingly say, he was the mayor, he was the police chief, he was everything <laughs> in town. He started a program called the Stephen Ministry, which is ecumenical around the country. And um, basically the idea is you study for a period of time to become uh, a a caring support for the pastor, like taking a, you'll be signed someone in the congregation yeah, yeah. to be friend and and it, one of the big skills we learned, which is a tough one for everybody, is listening. So we took the class and I was assigned to a lovely older woman in the congregation and um, then they asked me if I would be willing to become a leader. I, so I had to t go for training so they're training all over the country so i picked san antonio because i wanted to see texas <laughs> so i had two weeks in san antonio with this rich experience of meeting all these people training for this service and just i just really really loved it that's wonderful yep that was a highlight that's, um yes. let's see i took my daughters to paris it was a dream that oh, I would take them to Paris. This was in 2001. Um, and um, it, was, it was very meaningful for me. I, they're not Francophiles like I am, but it was a wonderful experience for mother and daughters. Absolutely. Tell me about those daughters. Oh, well, my oldest daughter just retired from the oh. CIA. Wow. And the CIA gives a um, um, day-long program to celebrate you. Mm. So we went down there and, um, mm. and had a wonderful day mm. at, in the CIA and tours and everything. And she was quite, of course, she never could talk about it. We right. have never known exactly what she did. Right. But um, so that was a fun day to, to find bet. out. She, she have been always been, I always, a great daughter. She was valedictorian in high school and she never gave us a bit of trouble. Mm. But she was, he was not a conversationalist. Mm -hmm. So the CIA was perfect for her and she rose up quite high there. Mm. So, um, and she had two daughters. Um, sadly, her youngest daughter, 16 committed suicide, so that's mm. been a heavy load for the family. Yeah. And her older daughter now is married, and she just got her master's in counseling, and she's married to an Ecuadorian young man who's a ship captain. 
wow. in the Galapagos. My goodness. And he's lo looking to come here eventually. Wow. Yeah. And so, um, and he's a wonderful, wonderful guy. That's great. And so my other daughter is lives here. I mean, she's, oh. she works at um, dealer.com. Yep. Doing very well there. Nice. And she works at home, which yeah. is what happened when everything. Yeah. Okay, and she has uh, two kids. Her, my grandson is uh, going to be a junior at the University of Florida, and my granddaughter is 16. She's going to go to Rice High School. Fantastic. She's transferring. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And right now she's in Peru on a, an exchange program where they do service and travel and family mm -hmm. interaction. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and she, my daughter here is the one that said to us years ago, you need to move, we need to be closer. Oh. And I kept saying, no, I'm not leaving Maine. <laughs> 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 then we came over in 2016 and um, we had a wonderful mm. family time, you know, with the mm. kids and her That's and her, her husband, of course. So, yeah. Now that, been, that decision you made years ago to um, devote your time to your daughters and not have a working career outside the house, mm -hmm. did it pay off? Yes. <laughs> Thank it. you for asking. <laughs> I, I, I know other people do both. It pays off. <laughs> but I couldn't. Emotionally, I knew, I, yeah. I knew that I couldn't. Yeah. And so I had to find my... Um, you know, my joy and my, yeah. of, in other ways. And um, I, th I think, I think it did pay off. And the other thing is, I'm the, I'm the heavy, because I was alone with them. So, you know, I did the disciplining and everything. Mm -hmm. Right. And their dad is perfect in their eyes. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> He's the cherry on top of the dessert. Yes, and, and that's fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I wanted. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Anything, any, we're going to wrap up soon, and I just want mm -hmm. any um, thing that you haven't mentioned that you want to mention, and is there any quotes or wisdom that you want to impart to well, others I'll about I'll start life? with uh, the one thing I didn't mention, which, which yeah. we really enjoyed. We had a small cottage in Maine for 20 some years in the Belgrade Lakes. And like a lot of other lakes, they're being bombarded with invasive plants and mm. animals and algaes and all sorts of things. Yep. We got, Dave and I got involved with an organization called Lake Smart. And what it was, was we were trained to help property owners on lakes improve their properties to stop runoff. Wow. And we Beautiful. did it for 10 years, and it, it was a wonderful experience. We met a lot of nice people and interesting. And we learned some, you know, valuable skills. Yeah. And um, Dave, from time to time, there would be a little glitches with the leadership, and Dave would jump in. He jumped in twice and took over and managed it for, for a while, and I helped him with that, too. But... Um, it was just very, very satisfying, and it's it's a non it's an ongoing thing. I think um, the main Lake Smart was co uh, copied by the Vermont equivalent, which has a different name, which mm. I can't remember. But mm. anyway, so um, but it's an Wonderful. ongoing problem. It's you know yeah it's a, it's a never ending. There's there's no yes. uh, final resolution, but people are so dedicated to it. And we enjoyed it. You you have over the years through volunteering and diff done contributed a lot to Thank you. your communities. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean it's cl it's clear. Mm -hmm. We all you know, and when when we're young, you want want to go out there and save the world in big ways, but there's so much you can do that's just at the exactly at the end of your hand. Yeah, and that's taken me a while to figure that out, hmm. but definitely. Good for you. Any wisdom you want to share? Well, um, I have a couple quotes. Yeah. This is one that's really stuck with me. I read this book by Terry Tempest Williams. She's sort of an environmentalist. And um, 
what she said just really resonated with me. The name of the book was Finding Beauty in a Broken World. Mm. And in my spiritual journey, beauty is a big component of, of, of creating beauty, appreciating beauty, mm. sharing beauty, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and, and she, I remember specifically, she went to Rwanda where they had that horrible genocide and she and a group of people built a memorial there, and um, it was, and so it's sort of helping to find meaning in some of this chaos and negativity, and bringing people together around it. And I really love that. Mm. For me, it just speaks to me. Mm. And then I have another quote, which is very popular. Everybody knows it, but it really, it really sums it up for me. We will not, this is from T.S. Eliot, we will not cease from exploration, and at the end of all our exploring, will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Mm. Love that. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. that's and that's beautiful. what, you know, for me, it highlights acceptance, which is where I'm at now, and peace, where I'm starting to have inklings of peace. Yes. So you have, uh, your book of life is amazing. Oh, thank with you. many more chapters than other people might have. Well, thank Each you. one has given you something, I can tell. And mm -hmm. your, uh, the book is still to be finished, but it's coming together beautifully. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you for being here today. You're welcome.